Welcome back. You're watching our continuous coverage here from Davos 2023. I'm Shireen Bhan and joining me now on the program is the CEO of the Vaccine Alliance, Gavi Seth Brakley. Thanks very much, Seth, for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. This is where it all started. Davos was where Gavi was born. 23 years later, uh, perhaps the most significant test of the alliance has been the COVID pandemic. What has been the biggest learning for you over the last three years? Well, it certainly has been the, the biggest test for the Alliance. The Alliance normally works on routine vaccines. We've delivered now more than uh, vaccines to more than a billion additional children, providing about 50 percent of the world's ch children with vaccines. By the way, the majority of those are made in India. And um, so we very much appreciate the Indian manufacturers and what they've done. Of course, with COVID, we had a pandemic that moved around the world. And the challenge was is we had to vaccinate the whole world. And in doing that, we had to vaccinate elderly populations, those with comorbidities and health workers. And traditionally in developing countries, we don't have systems to reach those. So it was about uh, countries stepping up and being able to adapt their systems to do that. Of course, scaling up vaccine production dramatically was necessary. And I, I think the biggest surprise was this issue of being able to take on risk. Gavi, as a public-private partnership, was able to take on risk. Many other partners we work with weren't able to, and that was really important for us to do the deals early and to get you know vaccines scaled up so they could be rolled out across the world. Absolutely, and I think Kobe Shield uh, that Serum Institute put in the market for India, uh, you know, did did come to the rescue of the Indian population, uh, and Gavi played a role there as well. But what I want to understand from you is you talked about the fact that many countries in the world don't have an adult immunization program and hence the last mile is the big challenge so at the start of the pandemic you had a problem where there wasn't enough vaccine at the end of the pandemic hopefully the end of the pandemic you have a situation where you have a glut of vaccines nobody need, knows what to do with them anymore but yet you're not being able to get them into people's arms well that is correct and there's a couple of reasons for that first of all you know many people are want to be done with the virus but we're not sure the virus is done with us. The virus continues to move around the world. We're still seeing new variants appear. We're obviously in China seeing a, a very different epidemic now that the, um, they've moved away from the zero COVID um, uh, uh, policy. And, and so we have to keep in mind that we don't know what's coming next. But um, with that, we've seen demand go down. We saw demand go down because of all the vaccine rumors and the politicization that went on. So what it's been is challenging to work with countries. Um, we've had enough vaccine since probably January, February of, of, of last year. And, and the challenge then has been to work with countries, make sure they have adequate delivery finance, they have adequate people to do this. And at the beginning of the year, there were 34 countries with less than 10% coverage. Today, there are seven countries with, with um, less than 10% coverage, and we're going to keep chipping away at that. The real focus is protecting that elderly and those people at highest risk, because we just don't know when the next variant's going to appear. Mm -hmm. What do you make of what's happening in China at this point in time? They have reopened. We don't have data on what the real numbers are at this point in time, but how concerned would you be? Well, there is no question that there were a large number of people at risk in China. One of the challenges with this virus is the, the vaccines work quite well to prevent severe disease and death, not as well On to block infections, mm -hmm. and, and particularly with some of the new variants. So, you know, we've seen explosive uh, um, spread around the world. And, um, you know, in China, um, there are people over 80 that have not been vaccinated or that got a full course of vaccines, but got it a year and a half or two years ago and haven't been boosted. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they are immunologically not well protected. But it isn't only China. I mean, if you look at my home country, the U.S., um, about a third of people aren't vaccinated and two thirds aren't boosted. And so around the world, you see these populations that are unprotected. The difference is in the U.S., natural infection has gone through. And so most people have some experience, you know, with some immunological uh, exposure to this. But in China, that may not be the case. Mm -hmm. What do you see as being the future of uh, vaccines? We've seen breakthrough technologies. The mRNA technology helped the world get a vaccine faster than one would have ever imagined. Uh, but how do you see this progressing? What is the evolution likely to be, especially with the use of AI and other technologies? Well, the power of science is extraordinary. And this is why the trust and having institutions that we can work with is going to be important, because a lot of the vaccine hesitancy came from politicization and rumors. 
But if we trust the science now, and if we continue to invest in it, it's, it's remarkable what can be done. Now, um, I'm very proud of the fact that India is now rolling out HPV vaccine, that's a vaccine against cervical cancer. Yes. We have another vaccine against, against um, uh, cancer, which is against liver cancer, hepatitis B. People don't normally know about that. They think of vaccines against just you know, acute infections, but these are vaccines that are affecting chronic diseases. And of course, where you'd like to go is to be able to prevent many chronic diseases. And I suspect that that's where we'll end up. We'll find many cancers have an, uh, an infectious antecedent, and if you can vaccinate against that, like we do with these two cancers, we'll be able to prevent it. So I think if we can continue the investment in working with the new technologies, we'll have a renaissance of vaccines in front of us. But is that a concern for you, uh, given the constraints that governments find themselves with on the fiscal side and the global macroeconomic environment, which is challenging to say the least at this point? Do you believe that investments uh, will take a setback? Well, I'm, I certainly am worried about that. First of all, on the, on the pandemic side, we've lived through panic, neglect, panic, neglect. And my worry now is we're in a, an era of poly crises right now. And so even though COVID, for example, continues to be a problem, but there are other infections. We had mpox, polio has been going out of control, you know, many other infectious diseases now. Um, people are focusing on the other crises and forgetting about this. So what we need to do, and that's one of the reasons I'm here in Davos, is to make sure that people continue to understand and think that we have to deal with multiple crises at the same time and have this long-term view. If we look at the defense industry, we spend a lot of money preparing for battles we don't have, thank goodness. Now, there is a war going yeah. on, but in yeah. general, we do that, and it's accepted everywhere in the world that you do that. We need the same mindset for pandemics, investing in peacetime to get vaccines ready to go. So if all of a sudden we have an outbreak, we can accelerate it as much as possible. And an exam example of this was we just had a, a you know an outbreak of Ebola yes. Sudan in Uganda. Now, we have a vaccine against Ebola Zaire. That was from the 14th, 15 mm -hmm. outbreak. We worked to make sure that there would be a stockpile, which we've used many times since then. But we didn't prepare for an Ebola Sudan outbreak. And so when it occurred, people had a scramble. 80 days later, they got vaccines, but luckily, the epidemic was over, so now we don't know if any of those vaccines work. We need to do better and be as rapid as possible on dealing with these. You know, you're talking about uh, investments, you're also talking about global cooperation, and this is going to be one of the issues that uh, India takes forward as far uh, of the G20 agenda as it has assumed the G20's presidency. You also talked about India's importance from a vaccine manufacturing perspective, the HPV vaccine and uh, end of the year a malaria vaccine as well from Serum Institute. What is the role that you believe India can play uh, in trying to nurture this global cooperation? Well, first of all, India has, uh, I think, the largest number of FDA certified plants outside of the U.S. And, and, of course, has been the great provider of vaccines, particularly for the world. As I said, you know, we're the largest supplier of vaccines in the world, greater than 50 percent of the world's children. And India is providing more than 50 percent of those vaccines. I think now um, countries after COVID have been nervous if they don't have vaccine manufacturing. It can't be in every country, but now they want to make sure that there's at least some regional manufacturing. And one of the things a number of Indian companies have done, Serum Institute of India, Bharat, have begun to work with developing countries to do technology transfers and to engage with them. So I think these are some of the new ways of working that we will see going forward. And it's gonna be important also, given the R&D that India is doing, that we have ways to drive forward R&D for diseases of poverty. And, and that's where India is obviously both a developed country, but also has parts of it that are a developing country. And there may be, um, you know, shared interest in doing research, shared interest in getting uh, reasonable priced products that mm. can be used by the masses. Mm -hmm. Let me end by asking you, uh, you know, while, while we've dealt with the pandemic over the last three years, uh, a lot of the bandwidth and the focus and the attention shifted away from other diseases uh, that do require attention and urgent intervention. What are you most concerned about? Uh, where is the backslide that you're most concerned about? Well, of course, for our area, it's vaccines. And if you look at India, which has a great vaccine program, 
um, the Prime Minister particularly has had in interest in Mission Indra Hanush and had driven up coverage, reduced the number of families and communities that didn't have vaccination. There was backsliding during COVID. Now there is an attempt now to move forward on that, and India is very good at, at, at doing that type of approach. But many other countries have had that happen. We saw a drop of about 5%. Um, now, of course, they scaled up COVID vaccines, so they delivered many more doses, but 5% for routine vaccines, that's enough to see outbreaks. And that's why we're seeing outbreaks of measles, cholera, um, you know, other diseases, uh, polio. And so what we need to do is get those coverage levels back as soon as we can, but continue the process of trying to get universal immunization. Now, I just talked about immunization, but for tuberculosis mm -hmm. or for HIV or for maternal mortality, all of those programs took a real hit. In fact, the immunization took the least, even though it's the most distributed program, because it's a very resilient system. But we need to make it more resilient, and we need to be ready. It is evolutionarily certain we will have more outbreaks. They're going to yeah. come more frequently. And so we need that system to be strong so we can prepare for the next outbreak. So 23 years on, here is where it all began. What is the message to global leaders in Davos? Well, the message is, yes, deal with the crisis of today but also keep in mind the important work that's going on to make the world a safer place because at the end of the day when there is a pandemic you're only safe if everyone is safe and so we need to make sure that we can do that. Seth Berkeley, always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining us on CNBC TV 18. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. We are going to take a break here on the Davos Dialogue but we continue our conversations when we return after this very short break. Stay tuned. We're back in a minute.